Hello everyone and welcome to the third virtual Endo March presented by the Endometriosis Network Canada. On behalf of 10C, thank you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for supporting us over the years and for joining us during this special occasion once again. I wish to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Alexis Nicklich. I am on the board of directors for the Endometriosis Network Canada and I currently operate as the support group coordinator and as the race director for the Endo Network's Run to End Endo. We feel very fortunate that we are able to host this event together this year and switch things up a little bit. Absolutely. And welcome to all of the wonderful community members celebrating virtual Endo March with us across Canada. My name is Katie Luciani and I am the executive director of the Endometriosis Network Canada as well as a volunteer member of EndoAct Canada. I can't begin to express how incredible it has been to witness our community come together and grow the way it has over this past year especially. We are beyond grateful for every single person that makes up our community. All of you are fundamental to helping us grow our support, our educational resources, expand our reach, and increase our ability to raise awareness to the benefit of those affected by endo in 2022. A big thanks to the amazing drive and dedication of our team. We have an amazing event lined up for you today with lots of exciting announcements. So stay tuned and if you're comfortable enough to participate, please let us know in the chat where you are tuning in from today. We would love to hear from each and every one of you. We would like to encourage everyone to take a moment to find a comfortable place to tune in from, have a yoga mat or some blankets ready, grab a couple of pillows if that's of interest, and get ready to enjoy Tensi's signature mocktail, The Golden Goin. Before Katie introduces our first guest of the day, I'd like to thank our Illuminations team for doing such an incredible job. They have secured over 60 monuments that will be illuminated yellow across the country. Be sure to check out our website for the full list of locations if you haven't already, because we will be holding an illumination photo challenge this year. To enter, simply locate a lighting nearest you, and on the day of the lighting, take a photo and send it via email along with your name and the name of the monument to alexis.nicolich at endometriosisnetwork.ca. All of the photos submitted will be added to a Google form and made available to the public to vote for your favorite, so be sure to invite your family and friends to vote as well, because the person with the most votes will receive the ingredients to recreate the Golden Goin' Mocktail at home. The month of March is a very special time for everyone in the endometriosis community. It's a time to come together and raise awareness and there's even more reason to celebrate this year with a very special thanks to our first guest who recently passed a bill in Ontario recognizing March as Endometriosis Awareness Month. We are so honored to have her joining us today to speak to her recent achievements and why this bill is so important to her personally. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to the wonderful Merritt Siles. Hello everyone, I'm Marit Stiles and I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for Davenport, which is in downtown West End, Toronto. And I am, uh, I was also born and raised in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I'm a mom with two great daughters. I'm also a member of the official opposition NDP caucus here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Endometriosis Network of Canada, uh, for letting me join you on this virtual endo march. It's pretty exciting. Folks, uh, it is a real privilege because I know from experience, there are few people more fierce than you endo warriors. Uh, coming together like this to improve awareness, to make change, well, it's so important for so many reasons, but I think for those of us who have suffered with endometriosis, you spend a lot of your life feeling very alone. So that makes it even more special when you find a community of people that can share your experience. And you've spent a lot of your life thinking there's something wrong with you. Maybe someone told you that you must have a low pain threshold. That's happened to me. Or that the pill would clear that right up. Where have you heard that before? And uh, oh yeah, my favorite one. It's, it's all in your head. 
Yeah, right. You've probably missed a lot of school. You've missed work. Uh, you've not wanted to explain it to your boss or your teachers because of the stigma and the shame and because you knew that they would be thinking that you were exaggerating. Uh, you probably missed some important games and competitions and meetings. And I tell you, those are my stories too. Uh, they are so many stories like that. And uh, and my case was was a pretty mild one, frankly. So for many of you and the people that you love, I know it's been even more debilitating. But like a lot of you, I was never diagnosed or offered any surgical treatment until the issue became a reproductive one. And you know, it's like, that's all that mattered about me. So when I was elected to the Ontario legislature um, a few years ago, I made a little list of things I wanted to accomplish. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was able to bring some of my own personal experience to bear on getting some things changed. And one of those things was finding a way to help raise awareness, build research and treatment for endometriosis so that maybe someday people wouldn't have to deal with the same stuff I did. So I introduced a little piece of legislation aimed at just declaring March Endometriosis Awareness Month. And it kind of flew under the radar. I mean, the media didn't really pick it up and, you know, just kind of seemed to just sit there. But then this fall, out of nowhere and all in one day, I find out that the government has decided to pull my little opposition bill out of a big pile of legislation waiting to be debated and give it some air. So within a week, we were actually able to pass the bill with all party support. And now March is officially Endometriosis Awareness Month in Ontario. Um, if you get a chance, you can actually go online and you can see uh, the debate. You can listen to it or you can read the transcripts. It's actually really interesting because you'll see that these are your stories that are being told. Um, and what you don't see is the people who were coming up to me in between those debates and discussions um, saying, wow, I didn't even know this was a thing. And I'm so glad you raised this. And how is it possible that with so many people suffering, no one knows about it? So it's a small step, but it's an important one because we can use this as a platform to keep the conversation going and to build awareness and to build pressure for government to do the important work that has to happen. The Endo Act mission, the movement to improve the lives of people with endometriosis in Canada by driving policy action based on science and ground it in the needs of the endometriosis community, that's you. So we can have the world, the Canada, where all people with endometriosis receive the right care, in the right place, at the right time. My next big obsession is improving period and uh, well, menstrual education and endometriosis education in our schools. But folks, I am thrilled to be here with all of you. It's a privilege that I was able to bring forward that bill and get it passed. And I look forward to working together with all of you to get more good stuff done. Stay well and uh, let's do this. Have a fun March. Thank you so much, Marit, for all that you do for the endometriosis community. I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone to sign up for our newsletter to receive information on the latest endometriosis news and upcoming events. Thank you so much to our dedicated volunteers and donors. We couldn't be where we are today without your generosity and commitment to endometriosis awareness. We are so very grateful for each and every one of you. We're very excited to introduce our next speaker. She has endured symptoms since the age of 11. At 12 years old, she left school due to unbearable symptoms and was finally diagnosed with endometriosis at age 19 via surgery. She is now a vocal endometriosis advocate for young adults and teens. Please welcome the inspirational Nevin, a member of our teen and young adult advisory committee. Hello, my name is Nevin O'Grady and I'm 20 years old. I've suffered from endometriosis since I was 11 and it took me almost nine years to receive my diagnosis at age 19. My symptoms of endometriosis presented themselves before my first period came along. I heavily suffered from pelvic pain, nausea, vomiting, extreme bloating, back, leg, hip, joint pain, etc. 
I left school at age 12 due to how bad my symptoms were. I was physically unable to sit through a full day of school. Trying to figure out what was wrong with me was a challenge. I was in and out of hospitals so much they knew me by name, but no one could help me or knew what was wrong. I was told that I was making it up, that I was just depressed, that some people just had painful periods, that I needed to exercise because I was just overweight. I got nothing but excuses every time and no real help or empathy with trying to figure out what was causing my pain. Out of all the times I was in the ER, I heard the word endometriosis one time from a nurse. She told me she was so sorry and that it sounded just like endo. She briefly explained what endo was and sent us home. Looking back now, even she had the definition wrong. We did all of our own research when we got home that night and it was like a breath of fresh air. I had endometriosis. Now it was the time to find a doctor to hear me out and believe me enough to help me. I was only 14 years old and learning what we just had, I realized I still had a very, very long fight ahead of me. Doctors do not take owners of uteruses seriously. I had to rule everything out before they would send me to a gynae. I was referred to a gastroenterologist next. The first thing we did was food elimination, but it made no real difference. I had a colonoscopy and a gastroscopy. I will never forget her coming up to my mom and I afterwards and telling me how everything looked perfect and how my insides were perfectly pink like a watermelon. You never want anything to be wrong, but in those moments, I really hoped she would have found something, anything. It was yet another dead end. Another doctor telling me I was perfectly fine and nothing was wrong. I was losing weight very, very quickly and I was sick all of the time. She came to the conclusion that I had vomited out the entire lining of my stomach and caused myself nerve damage. I was in so much pain that I threw up the entire lining of my stomach. She also recommended that I see a psychologist because she thought I was just depressed and causing myself to be in more pain than I needed to be in. As a 14 year old girl who had only ever known happiness before the age of 11, this was heartbreaking to hear. Something was wrong and I was so sad that no one would take me seriously. I was sad because I was in pain, and I was not in pain because I was sad. We were back to square one, but at this point, the doctors had ruled out everything else, so they finally sent me to an OBGYN. She pretty much immediately threw me on birth control. This is the case for majority of uterus owners. Birth control is a band-aid, and it can mask symptoms. For me, this was not the case at all. I was incredibly depressed and borderline suicidal while on it, while still dealing with all my symptoms. She discharged me from her care and suggested I go back to see my GP. After a very long wait, my GP sent a referral out for me to see another OBGYN, but this time at Sick Kids Hospital. I was put on another med called Bizan and was told to stay on it until I was ready to have kids. I saw her a few times and each time I left in tears. I was 16 years old at this point and she suggested I join Weight Watchers because I was just overweight. And when the Zan didn't mask my symptoms, I was met with, I'm 99.9% .9 sure you do not have endometriosis because that med would have helped you. I stayed under her care until age 17 to when she discharged me because I was almost aging out of sick kids. So back to my GP, we went again. I was literally being thrown from doctor to doctor and no one knew what they were doing. No one was on the same page and no one was on my side. Because I was almost 18, I could finally start looking for an endometriosis specialist. I gathered a few names and went back to my family doctor and demanded they be sent out. A few were denied because of my age and thankfully one was accepted. October 13th, 2019, I got the news that I would finally be seeing an endometriosis specialist. In the seven years, the only people who had ever validated my pain were my close friends and family. That changed on August 13th, 2020. I felt heard, I was believed, and I left that appointment knowing I had been placed on the OR list, meaning it was acknowledged that I needed surgery. October 1st, 2021 came around and I got the call. I had a surgery date. It was bittersweet, it was terrifying, and it was relieving. I spent nine years being convinced by doctors that it was in my head, that I was making it up, that I was just depressed or wanting attention. And on October 13th, 2021, I proved them all wrong. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't making it up. Endometriosis was found and excision surgery was done. 
The back of my uterus was fused together. I had a cyst on one of my tubes and endometriosis was found in other places. October 13th was the biggest day of my life thus far. I always knew, but getting the real diagnosis from doctors who validated me, believed me, and cared enough to try and help me was exactly what I needed all of those years. Thank you, Nevin, for taking the time to share your story and strength with us here today. The Endometriosis Network Canada is excited to share that we have created a teen and young adult advisory committee in which we aim to understand the needs of teens and young adults living with or suspect they have endometriosis and creating specific resources as well as support, especially for those who are just beginning their journey with endo. If you would like to know more about the Teen and Young Adult Advisory Committee, please contact info at endometriosisnetwork.ca. For our first interactive segment of the day, I encourage everyone to grab their yoga mats or some blankets and a pillow, whatever you need to make yourself comfortable, and let's settle in for a gentle yoga session with Desiree. Desiree is a board member with the Endometriosis Network Canada, and she also has a passion for yoga. She has been teaching yoga for seven years and practicing for 11. In addition to her 200 hour yoga teacher training, she completed additional training in yin and power yoga, as well as mindfulness based stress reduction. Please welcome Desiree and enjoy. Hi there, thank you for joining me. My name is Desiree Adams. I will be guiding you through this gentle yoga movement practice from Ottawa, Ontario, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation. I will, we will remain on our backs for the duration of the practice and I'll be demoing from my mat here. But I encourage you to practice wherever is comfortable for you. So that might mean your bed, your couch, your floor, and please listen to your body modifying any of the postures in ways that make sense to you and your body. I know that that's something that a lot of us have to work with in the endo community and it's something that I definitely am very familiar with. So I encourage you to do that as much as you need to know that I'm just offering you suggestions. So to get started, come into our backs. If you want, you can keep a blanket nearby, but you don't need one. It might be helpful for a couple postures. Beginning with our feet on the floor, maybe bringing knees together, palms flat, sinking into the mat, checking in with your breath, inviting you to start to lengthen out your inhales and your exhales, and separating your knees hip width apart. Inhale, pressing into your feet, lifting your hips up, hands come up behind you. Exhale, lower down slowly, trying to bring your tailbone down last. Two more, inhale, press into your feet, nice and gentle. Your hips don't have to come that high, only as high as is comfortable. Exhale, bringing everything down to the mat. Knees come in, giving yourself a big hug, sending yourself some self-love, rocking left to right, committing to be gentle with your body for the next 10 minutes, drawing circles on the ceiling with your knees, going one way and then the other, interlacing your hands on top of your right shin, sending your left leg out in front of you, Inhales, feel your belly make contact with your thigh. Exhales, maybe bringing your right knee in a little bit closer. Intending your knee in towards you, but trying to practice some gentleness and sweetness. No need to keep any tension or lots of tension through your arms or your neck. Bending your left knee, placing the sole of your left foot on the mat, crossing your right ankle on top of your left shin, maybe choosing to stay here, gently using the right hand to intend your right knee forward, or lifting up your left foot and interlacing your hands over top of your left thigh, 
Inviting some movement here if that makes sense in your body, giving yourself a left to right, a little rock. If stillness makes more sense to you, please honor that in your practice. Still finding your breath nice and long, nice and deep. Releasing through the side. Bringing in your left knee this time, sending your right leg out in front of you. Tending your left knee in closer to your chest if that's possible. No need to force anything. Then coming into our figure four on the opposite side, left ankle on top of right thigh, maybe staying here, keeping it gentle, or lifting your right foot up, still keeping it gentle, but just a bit, bit more intensity. Again, locking, rocking left to right if that feels right in your body for you. Closing your eyes if that feels nice. Releasing your finger four, knees coming to your chest to give you another last squeeze. Feet come down, hips shimmy over towards the right side of your mat. The rest of you stays where it is. Inhale, knees come up, and then tip over to the left side, arms are out to a T. If you have your blanket and you want to use it, you might want to use it in between your knees or perhaps underneath your legs. Arms can be in T or cactus, depending on how much space you have around you. Relaxing into the mat underneath you. Long, slow, steady breath. Inhale, knees come back up to center. Shimmying your bum over to the left side this time, allowing your knees to fall over to the right, maybe taking your blanket along for the ride, choosing your arm variation. Trying to relax through your hips, through your knees. Releasing your blanket, coming back to center, repositioning your hips on the mat into the center, giving your knees a windshield washer from left to right, maybe taking your lower jaw along for the ride if you want to release some jaw tension. It looks funny, but <laughs> probably no one's looking at you. Right, coming back to center and finding our way to happy baby. First option being taking your hands to the backs of your thighs. This might feel like enough. If not, hands come to the outsides of your feet. Or peace fingers, loop your big toes. Rocking your baby if that feels nice. I invite you to bring a smile to your face. If you don't already have one, making sure that our baby is really happy. Sending yourself a little love in this posture. Releasing in your own time, knees come back into your chest again. Drawing some circles on the ceiling, one direction and the other. Releasing out into your final resting posture. So that might mean 
Uh, my personal favorite is feet come wide, knees knock together. I find that this allows me to really release my lower back onto the mat. You might want to take your legs out fully straight, palms face up or down. You can even use your blanket and put it underneath your bum if that gives you more support. Finding stillness, closing your eyes if that's comfortable for you, if not, relaxing them. Letting your breath be natural, not worrying too much about making it or shaping it. Pulling your shoulders away from your ears. Letting your eyes fall into their sockets. Creating space between your teeth, relaxing your jaw. Bringing your awareness to the space between your eyebrows. Noticing the floor underneath you and allowing your body to sink into it. Trusting it to hold you up. I invite you to stay in your Shavasana for as long as you like. No need to come out of it just because I'm telling you to. But if not to wrap up, stretching out through your fingers and your toes, rolling through your right side, using your right bicep as a pillow, pressing yourself back up to sitting, Thank you so much for practicing with me today. It was a privilege to guide you through the last 10 minutes, and I would invite you to take some time to thank yourselves for taking this time for yourself. It's, it's not a small act, and I honor that. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you so much, Desiree, for guiding us through that relaxing yoga session. We hope that you all enjoyed it, and please let us know how you're feeling in the comments. If you're interested in joining the various wellness classes that Tensi has been able to offer, thanks to the generosity of our wellness leaders, head over to endometriosisnetwork.com slash events to learn more. Our next guest speaker joins us as a board member of the Endometriosis Network Canada, as well as a member of EndoAct Canada. Denise is a social service worker with an honors graduate from the Social Service Worker Program at Sheridan College and she wants to raise awareness about endometriosis by bringing her lived experience with the chronic disease to Canadians. She is here today to provide an update on EndoAct Canada. Please welcome Denise. Hi, I'm Denise Campbell. I'm a director on the board of the Endometriosis Network Canada and also a member of the not-for-profit group EndoAct Canada. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what EndoAct is doing to try to drive policy change on endometriosis in Canada. We have been inspired by the successful work of endometriosis advocates internationally in getting governments to recognize the burden of endometriosis and create strategies to address this. EndoAct was initiated because we heard from so many people that they were frustrated by a lack of government attention to the problem faced by people in Canada with endometriosis. EndoAct Canada was created with the mission to improve the lives of people with endometriosis in Canada by driving policy action. We are advocating for a national action plan on endometriosis so that people can receive the right care in the right place at the right time. EndoAct brings together people with lived experience of endometriosis, healthcare professionals, and endometriosis researchers. Our volunteers bring a lot of different perspectives to the work and represent different ages, 
areas of Canada, sexualities, genders, race, and abilities. Our guiding values are inclusivity, equity, partnership, and excellence. I personally became involved with TENC and ENDOAC because I wanted to use my experience with endometriosis to help others and create change so that others don't have to go through what I did. Black people with endometriosis have even more difficult time getting a diagnosis and doctors are less likely to believe us about our pain. For many years, I suffered from the pain of pelvic, diaphragmatic, thoracic, and umbilical endometriosis before getting a diagnosis. I missed out on many things that are important to me in my life, like work social life, and my favorite activities. About a year ago, Endoac launched a website and a social media campaign inviting Canadians with endometriosis to share their personal stories to which are published on the Endoac website. By bringing together our stories, we can help other people in Canada, including elected officials and policymakers understand the impact of endometriosis across the country. Recently, we launched a public advocacy campaign to ask members of parliament to act on endometriosis awareness, diagnosis, treatment, and research in Canada. We created a toolkit called Act on Endo to help endometriosis advocates in Canada contact their MPs, which included a template letter and email to send to your MP, template posts for social media, and a guide to a successful meeting with your MP. You can find this toolkit on endoact.ca website and use it to contact MPs from any party to tell them about your endometriosis experience and priorities. Your involvement could be as simple as sending a letter or email, or as much as setting up a meeting to talk to your MP virtually. Our government needs to hear about our experiences, the gaps and challenges in the healthcare system for people with endometriosis, and what we as patients have as priorities for change. We want to thank everyone who has shared their endometriosis stories with us and everyone who has contacted their MPs so far. Thank you. Hearing the voices of the endometriosis community is critical in, for making change in Canada and creating a better future for those with endo. To follow our work and be informed about opportunities to get involved, you can subscribe to the newsletter on the endoact.ca website and follow endoact on social media. Thank you so much, Denise, for joining us today. We are so grateful for all that you do. I wish to take a moment to let everyone know that Tensi is incredibly excited to announce that we have officially launched our new Endo Ambassador program. The purpose of this program is to bring a voice to and address the issues faced by those navigating endometriosis in disinvested as well as historically and intentionally excluded communities across Canada. To learn more, contact the 10C team at info at endometriosisnetwork.ca and if you know someone that would make a great 10C endo ambassador, feel free to take them in the comments. I'm very honored to introduce our next guests. Stephanie and Joe join us today to share their story of advocacy, recovery, support, and love. Stephanie was diagnosed with endometriosis at the age of 33 and has experienced delayed diagnosis, failed treatments, surgeries, complications, and losses as a result. Joe has witnessed the trials and tribulations of his wife's journey and has actively accommodated the lifestyle requirements associated with her condition. Joe currently works full-time as well as being Stephanie's caregiver. 
please give a very warm welcome to Stephanie and Joe. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm uh, Stephanie husband Joe. Uh, we've been together for almost 12 years. Uh, I didn't know that I had endometriosis when we first met. Um, I was diagnosed um, about a year after we were married and I had my first surgery, my excision surgery, um, about a year and a half after we got married. Um, and there were a lot of complications and I ended up uh, having a hysterectomy the following year for suspected adenomyosis. Um, and that's kind of when my health took a decline and uh, it really uh, tested our relationship and um, really brought about the support that I needed from him. Yeah, and I think it's been, um, it's been difficult uh, to maintain a full-time job and to support uh, Stephanie in this uh, and everything that she's been going through with endometriosis uh, and just getting the help that she needs um, and having to see her specialists in Toronto and uh, making time for that. Uh, it's been uh, it's been definitely challenging yeah. for us. And as my health uh, began to decline over the years, um, it really became difficult and his support has been essential to helping me continue on uh, because it is a challenge uh, to see, and I know how hard it is on him to see me um, being so sick and not to be able to help me. And I think there, we can both share that there's a sense of helplessness that you can't get the care that you need when you need it. Um, and the fact that there's not a lot of um, knowledge about endometriosis out there uh, that we need. Um, yeah, I feel like I've had to learn things just from the doctors and about what Steph tells me about endometriosis and uh, trying to give her the support that she needs at home um, and trying to make her comfortable. Um, but there is definitely a sense of helplessness and uh, that, you know, it's challenging to find that help out there from the doctors and um, any programs. Yeah. And to find someone who will listen and take your symptoms uh, seriously. And I find like a lot of our time is spent on the phone um, at appointments in the ERs uh, trying to get care. Uh, that's hard for him, I know, and it's hard on our relationship. Um, I think anyone in a relationship can attest to that. Um, and that's where communicating what I need is important and giving him the space that he needs to process all of this. Um, and uh, I think by accessing the support groups out there through the Endo Network and the online community has really helped kind of take a little bit of that pressure off because I'm able to talk to other people about what I'm going through. Um, but he is here every minute of the day, um, especially since the pandemic and working from home. Um, having to care for me uh, now that my health has really uh, gotten bad. Um, yeah, I think that social media, social media has definitely uh, helped our uh, you know relationship, and um, it's given me a little bit of space. It's given her an outlet to talk to others mm -hmm. who are experiencing the same thing. Um, and then there's also even when she's talking with others on social media. Uh, word spreads that you know there's help in certain areas or certain supports here or there uh, that are within reach and it's definitely played a factor in, um, in helping mm -hmm. Steph and helping our relationship too. And I think uh, support from him has also come in the form of helping to raise awareness um, especially during March for Endometriosis Awareness Month. Um, he helps me make the, the ribbons and uh, to attend an illumination event. Um, and just by uh, wearing his ribbon, he's had people ask him what endometriosis is and he's able to explain it now. Um, and that really, that really feels good, um, knowing that he's out there uh, spreading awareness. And um, I think having a supportive partner um, and a support system is really the most important thing 
um, to a person with endometriosis uh, because it's isolating, it's difficult on a daily basis, um, especially when you're in a flare and you're having pain and having someone there just comforting you, bringing your heating pad um, and just listening to you. And I know it's hard for him, but he's really, his support has been unwavering through all of this. And um, I'm grateful for that. So, yeah, thank you very much. I hope this brings awareness. Thank you both so much for sharing your vulnerability and your strength with us here today. Your support and dedication to one another is truly inspirational. Let's take a moment and think about that person or the people that you love and support, whether it's a family member or a friend with or without endo, and tag that person in the comments to show that you're thinking of them. While Tensi's vlog series titled Viewpoints, Voice and Advocacy has been on hold as our team has focused on other projects, we are thrilled to announce that we will be expanding the series later this year as well, so stay tuned for updates. Speaking of love and support, our next guest joins us today as a mindset coach and a community builder who specializes in NLP, hypnosis, and emotional freedom techniques. It is her mission to help folks rise above their circumstances and transform their lives. Please find a comfortable place to rest, and we hope that you all enjoy participating in this EFT tapping session. Welcome, Franny. Hello, my name is Francesca Brunsden. You can also call me Franny. Um, I'm a mindset coach, a life coach, and I specialize in EFT tapping, NLP, and hypnosis. And I'm also a Reiki practitioner. So I'm here with you today to share two tools for your toolkit in order for you to be able to um, access these to make yourself feel better at any time you like. Um, so the first one is gonna be emotional freedom technique, tapping. Um, if you haven't heard of that before, it's a way to tap through the meridian points of your body in order to release negative and unwanted wanted energy and maybe even help with pain um, in order to sort of release that and um, call in how we want to feel and um, think and all the rest of it. So I'm going to share with you a quick, um, a quick uh, tapping round. It'll be maybe five to six minutes that you can try any time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just create something that you can just follow along. All you've got to do is follow after me, tap in the same places as me. Um, do not worry about it doing wrong. You can't do yourself any harm. You can't say anything wrong. So yeah, just follow along. Um, a few things to tell you to start with. So there's several points for tapping top of the head, uh, top of the eyebrow, temple, cheek, top of the lip, chin, collarbone, or just under the collarbone if you can feel it, the fleshy part, and just under your armpit here, and I use the fist for that. Um, so they're the points, you're gonna follow along and you're gonna say everything out loud that I say out loud. If that's not available to you, that is totally fine, and you can say it in your head, or you can really connect to my words in order to feel into them and get the experience. Um, the first round will be all around um, thinking and feeling into the emotions that you already feel and connecting with that in order to bring the emotions up so you might feel a bit uncomfortable or icky and then we're going to release them. So don't worry. First round is all about that. Second round is about acceptance. And then the last round is all about calling in how you want to think, feel, and so on. And you should, by the end, feel a lot better. Start off with, I like to check in with myself. Um, I personally like to put my hands on my heart or my chest area. <sighs> Take a deep breath and sort of think, you know, how am I feeling right now? <sighs> so for me right now... Um, my energy feels good, but if I'm scaling myself from one to 10, I am, I'm probably about six because I'm a little bit nervous. I'm doing this, there's a lot of things going on in my head. So I'm, I'm not a 10, but I'm, I'm a six, maybe seven. And the idea is that we wanna move 
further up. So even if you're like, oh my God, I'm only a one or a two, do not worry. Um, it, the idea is just to move you. And that's all it is, is to create improvement and to have this tool to come back to whenever you want. So, um, the first round. Um, oops, sorry, top of the head. <laughs> I am in pain. I am not having a good day today. Um, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, when I feel uncomfortable, I feel helpless. And that leads to me feeling lonely. Like nobody understands me. I'm always skeptical that things like this are even going to work. Nothing has helped me in the past and those thoughts keep coming up. I just don't know what to do sometimes. Okay, so that's the first round. You should have feel feel into those unwanted emotions already. We we know I never tend to do a second round for the first round because we already know what not good feels like. So the next round is acceptance. Um, even though I'm in pain, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though this makes me feel uncomfortable, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though this has me feeling helpless, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I feel like nobody understands me, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I feel skeptical that this is going to work for me, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I find it really hard to find something that works for me, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I can be really hard on myself, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Okay, so hopefully you already feel a bit lighter. If you don't quite and you're like, oh, I don't know if I feel any better, then you can pause now, go back and do that round again and feel into that acceptance again. Sometimes that takes a little bit longer and that's okay. And then we're gonna do the last round, which is all around how you want to feel. Um, and again, you can even do that last round three times if you want. There's no right or wrong answer. Maybe just work through the whole series and see how you feel. So, I am safe. I have got through everything I have to date safely. I am well and I am capable. I feel light and I feel free. I feel confident. I feel confident in how I can take care of myself. It is safe for me to feel loved and supported. I am loved. Everyone loves to help and support me. I, tr I attract everything I need to thrive. I attract everything I need to thrive. I am perfect just the way I am. I feel amazing. Okay, so that's our whole sequence done. Again, you can do that sec this uh, third round a second time, so you can pause now, go back and do that again. Um, but like, check in now with how you feel first. Like, I definitely feel better. I feel like um, maybe a 10. I'm sorry, I was actually going to say maybe an 8 or a 9, not quite 10. Um, but I can really feel my energy lift and that's what it's all about. We've flushed out what we don't want and we've created an energy that um, better attracts uh, more of what we want and the, the frequency and the energy around 
what we what we want for ourselves rather than being stuck in those negative feelings and emotions so i hope you feel felt an improvement um i hope you've enjoyed it obviously this is something you can do anytime you want and the last thing i wanted to share with you before i go is a nice self-care practice around um journaling i love to journal um i think it's a really nice way to again connect to ourselves and think about how we're feeling so there's two things i like to do first of all um if you're feeling in like not a good mood or not a good place or not a good day write down everything you feel everything that's coming into your head like i'm having a pain um day i'm having a flare-up i'm feeling insert 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 get everything out of your head then once you've done that and you feel that like release from having got everything from um your mind straight onto the paper then i would use the journaling prompt what if because what if um creates possibility and curiosity around what you really want for yourself so that might look like what if today is a pain-free day what if this isn't a flare-up what if um everything that I need today happens just the way I need it to and what if um, everything happens just the way I want um, and then again we're calling in that curiosity and possibility and hopefully feeling a lot lighter for it and it allows you to really focus on what you do want and not what you don't want. Anyway I hope those two tools have been um, helpful and powerful for you it has been great to um, be able to do this and share this with you. It has been a complete honour. Thank you so much. And um, if I can support you in any way going forwards, please follow me on Instagram at Franny and Co. Um, I love to hear from you. Have a wonderful day. Um, bye bye. Thank you so much for guiding us through that session, Franny. It was amazing. Once again, please let us know how you're feeling in the comments and whether you've had experience with tapping before. We would like to quickly say a huge thank you to everyone who contributed their time and expertise to our virtual town hall meetings in which we discussed improving both access to surgical care and surgical outcomes for people with endometriosis. A very special thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. Our next guest, is an advanced gynecological surgeon and sonologist at McMaster University Medical Center in Hamilton, Canada, as well as a key member of the recently formed ONES, Ontario Network of Endometriosis Surgeons. He is very dedicated to advancing research to improve clinical care, and this will be the major focus of his career. Please welcome Dr. Leonardi as he joins us today with a message for the endometriosis community. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Leonardi. I'm a self-proclaimed and proud endo warrior. I'm also a gynecologic surgeon and ultrasound specialist at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. I'm filming this message to you from the tropical Blue Water, Ontario, where I've come for a little weekend getaway between busy clinic and surgery weeks. I'd like to thank the Endometriosis Network Canada for hosting this year's virtual endo march. I'd also like to thank them for their day-to-day -day work advocating for endometriosis patients across the country, and most recently, for their contribution to the development of the hashtag ActOnEndoAdvocacy Toolkit. This is sure going to shake up advocacy campaigns across our country from city to city, and it's going to get endometriosis the awareness that it has deserved for a very long time. Moreover, I'd like to thank in advance McMaster University for agreeing to light up McMaster on March 26th in yellow for endometriosis awareness. My message for this year's virtual endo march is that we must elevate the importance and quality of validation. There are many ways to do this, but in my world of gynecologic ultrasound, the ability to provide a tangible and visible diagnosis of endometriosis on ultrasound, which is the most used investigative tool for pelvic pain, achieves this validation. Advancements in gynecologic ultrasound are necessary as the current standard of care is insufficient, leaving many people uncertain and questioning 
when they have a normal pelvic ultrasound. In addition, patients and surgeons alike are being surprised on a daily basis when they have diagnostic laparoscopy. This too is below the level of care that we must provide. Over recent years, we have advocated for endometriosis surgery experts, which has been an incredible process. But now we must start to advocate for experts in gynecologic imaging so that patients can achieve a diagnosis of endometriosis soon, non-invasively, and in a way that allows for planning surgery in an ideal fashion. Finally, I must emphasize that even when high quality advanced gynecologic imaging is normal, this does not mean that what the person is experiencing is normal. We must continue to validate our patient's experiences as they are real. And we must not stop investigating and treating people even when an ultrasound is reported as normal. To conclude, I'd like to say that I am really excited about endometriosis care in Canada in 2022. And I really look forward to continuing to advocate together with all of you. Hashtag endo warriors. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonardi, for taking the time to hold space for the endometriosis community during this very special occasion. And thank you for always sharing your knowledge and for being such a vocal advocate for endometriosis awareness. If you are interested in learning more, head over to our blog and read our interview with Dr. Leonardi entitled Imaging for Endometriosis, an interview with Dr. Leonardi. Tensi's blog has continued to grow over the past year and now features a total of 48 written articles with many endo resources, info, and tips. If you're interested in volunteering for the Tensi blog, head over to endometriosisnetwork.com slash blog to learn how to get involved. I'm very excited to introduce our next guest, another member of the Teen and Young Adult Advisory Committee. Her personal journey with endometriosis involved many health professionals dismissing her symptoms before she finally received a diagnosis after four years. Madeline believes that everyone seeking a diagnosis or treatment for chronic health conditions have a right to be listened to and advocated for by health professionals, and that no one deserves to fight their battle with endo alone. Please welcome Madeline. My name is Madeline. I'm 20 years old, originally from Australia, and I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 18. I just wanted to say that I am incredibly grateful for the opportunity to speak at this event today. Um, and to share my story. I'm also really, really grateful for the wonderful team at Tennessee and all of my friends in the endo community. This is my endometriosis story. I got my first period at 12 years old and I experienced little to no pain. I remember at one point, um, I, a, a video was recommended to me about uh, someone's story with endometriosis. Um, and at the time, I, I thought, wow, I never knew that people could experience this. I didn't know this, this was a thing. Um, so when my own symptoms started to show up and to, to progress, I thought back to that video and, um, you know, I, I thought maybe I could have endometriosis. So it was really from about the ages of 15 to 17 when my symptoms um, increased. Um, the, the tiny amount of pain that I got when I first had my um, initial periods became so severe that I had to leave school. I had to lie down in the sick bay. I would get off my chair in class and I would have to crouch on the floor. Um, you know, I didn't even care what anyone thought of me because I was in that much pain. Um, I couldn't even drink water. I couldn't eat. I would dry retch. I would gag. I was in severe pain. Um, and I never used to miss school before this. So again, I thought back to the video I'd seen. I remember that information and I thought um, my symptoms sound very, very similar to her symptoms. 
maybe I do have endometriosis. My GP prescribed birth control um, and that didn't help me much at the time. Um, it caused other side effects and I got a blood clot so I had to stop. Um, but you know, I was still getting these really, really severe symptoms and severe pain. So I went back to a different GP and I suggested um, that I could have endometriosis. He said that this was highly unlikely. And I thought to myself, why? He ordered an ultrasound um, to rule out PCOS um, and a blood test as well, but both of those came back negative for PCOS and the ultrasound was otherwise clear. At that point, I got the impression from the GP that I just had to deal with my pain. Um, but I kept having days where I'd have to leave school and I knew this wasn't normal. I started to do my own research and came across an endometriosis support group um, based in Western Australia. Um, I started to learn from them about diagnosis, about excision, endometriosis specialists. And this group helped me to find the right info um, and allowed me to find the strength to advocate for myself. I was in the right direction because I took this information and I went back to my GP and said to him, can you please give me a referral um, to an endometriosis specialist? One of two endo specialists that perform exc excision surgeries in Perth, Western Australia. So I, I um, he wrote the letter, booked the appointment, and I had um, the consult with the endo specialist, and then eventually I had the surgery. Um, even going in, I doubted that they'd find anything, um, because, you know, my GP doubted it, my, some of my friends and family even doubted it. So I doubted, I began to doubt it. And the first thing that I said when I woke up was, did you find anything? And they said, yes, we found endometriosis. Finally, I had an answer. Years of dismissal, and I finally knew what was causing my pain and my symptoms. I remember holding the surgery photos in my hand and thinking, this is a real disease. This isn't just in my head, it's real. Since my surgery, I've been trying to find a pain plan, a pain relief plan that works for me. Um, I've had pelvic physiotherapy as well, which has helped, but I'll be honest, I still struggle. I still have days where I have to go to the emergency room. I still have days when my medication doesn't even touch my pain. I know it's a devastating disease that affects so many people, but there's still such a lack of awareness about it. And I really think that it should be taught in sex ed at school. Um, because if I had known this information back then, maybe I would have um, had a diagnosis sooner. Although my diagnosis only took about four or five years, which is quite, um, quite uh, a lot earlier than a lot of people. Um, especially as a prospective midwifery student, I believe in health education and I believe in advocacy. What I hope you'll take away from my story and from other stories today is that whatever your experience is, you know your body best. The reason I was directed to the right information about endometriosis was because of others in the community spreading awareness. This needs to continue so that the next person um, who's in the same shoes as me, um, seeking a diagnosis is believed by their doctor. You deserve to be listened to, you deserve to be advocated for and informed. You don't deserve to go through this alone. Thank you so much, Madeline, for taking the time to share your story, your warmth, and your kindness with us here today. Just a reminder that Tennessee's virtual support groups are still taking place on a monthly basis. The Toronto group is intended for those residing within the greater Toronto area, while the Canada-wide group is available for everyone else located across Canada. If you wish to register for one of the virtual support groups, head over to endometriosisnetwork.com, mouse over to find support, and then select support group registration from the drop-down menu. Our next interactive segment will be lighthearted and fun. 
Grab a piece of paper, your writing tool of choice, and find a comfortable place to participate in this art therapy session. Teresa is a registered psychotherapist, a professional member of the Canadian Art Therapy Association, and an Ontario certified teacher. Through her work, Teresa has seen how difficult emotions in children, teens, and adults can be eased through exploration in creative endeavors. Welcome, Teresa, and enjoy. Hi, my name is Teresa Patoza, and I'm an art therapist and a registered psychotherapist qualifying. I'm going to talk to you today about an art therapy directive called a mindfulness blind contour drawing. This directive is helpful for dealing with anxious or worried thoughts. And in order to participate today, you'll need a piece of paper and some drawing material. Paper doesn't have to be this big, but it's ideal. So you have lots of space to draw and any kind of drawing material, a pen, pencil, marker will do. The directive I'm going to show you today can be utilized one, if you're wanting to be in a mindfulness practice or two, if you find yourself in the habit of ruminating. Ruminating is when we have a negative thought pattern that pops up quite easily and the thoughts continue like they're on a loop. The more your brain gets in the habit of engaging in ruminating, the more easily and frequently these thoughts tend to pop up. If you have endometriosis, you may find ruminating thoughts can occur around the possibility of pain intensity increasing, worst case scenario thinking in regards to how long pain might last, or thoughts about what you should try in order to get pain relief. In some cases, this type of worrying can be beneficial because it leads to problem solving or creating a plan for these issues. Where rumination can become problematic is if no problem solving is occurring, but instead these cyclical thoughts are affecting your emotions by triggering further anxiety or your behaviors. Maybe you avoid situations as a result of these thoughts. In order to break the habit of ruminating, it's first important to catch yourself doing it and then shifting your attention to something else. And this is where this mindfulness blind contour drawing might be helpful. Before we begin the directive, I'll describe what the process will look and feel like. The first step will be to choose an object to draw. Typically, people will start with drawing a hand for a blind contour drawing. But if that feels too difficult for you, you might want to choose something simpler like your phone, a glass, a mug, or a water bottle. What you'll be doing is keeping your eyes on the edge, at the edge of the object, and while your eye is observing, your hand will be drawing exactly what your eye sees. If you have vision difficulty or are blind, use your hand to slowly touch the object and feel the edge of what the object looks like, and your other hand to draw exactly what your other hand is feeling. When you're moving attention, your attention around the edge of the object, use your breath as a marker to guide how slowly you should be observing. Notice how your lungs slowly fill with air and release air. And allow your eye to move and observe at the same pace as your breath. The only time your eyes will be looking down at the paper during this process is when you set your pencil down on the page and after the drawing is done. All right, let's try it out. To begin, place your pencil on the bottom portion of your page so you have enough room to move from side to side and up and down. Once your pencil is on the page, you'll no longer be looking at the page anymore and your attention will solely focus on your object. If you're drawing your hand, start in the bottom corner and slowly start to move your way up. As you begin drawing what your eye is seeing, slowly breathe in and out and move your attention up the side of your thumb. Notice the small dips and curves and the smaller lines that are on the edge of the thumb. As you're drawing and observing, notice any thoughts that come to your mind. Accept them, notice them, and then bring your attention back to your object in your drawing.
Keep breathing in and out slowly. If you find yourself speeding up, come back to your breath and slow your observation and your drawing down. Again, if any thoughts pop into your head, notice them and then shift your attention back to your drawing. Continue like this until you've finished observing your object. Once you're done, your object should look something like this or stranger. If you found that you went through the drawing too quickly, that could be because you were observing too quickly, try slowing down your breath and aiming for a longer period of time to do the drawing. Maybe your object that you chose was too simple and you need something more complex. So you may focus on drawing your foot, a plant, a tree, or even your face. The more you practice shifting your attention away from the ruminating thoughts, the more your brain gets into the habit of not engaging with those thoughts so easily and frequently. I hope you found this drawing practice helpful, but if you didn't, that's okay too. There are lots of mindfulness and art activities that you can explore, or simple art making practices you can use to maintain emotional well being. If you have any questions or would like to start working with an art therapist, you can go to the Canadian Art Therapy Association website to find more information at www.canadianarttherapy.org. Or if you're Ontario, in Ontario, you can visit the Ontario Art Therapy Association at oata.ca. Thank you to the Endometriosis Network Canada for allowing me to speak with you today. And to the Endo Warrior community, your strength is inspiring. I hope you meet yourself daily with compassion and find the support of other amazingly strong people through the Endometriosis Network Canada. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was such a unique experience and I really, really enjoyed it. We hope that you all did as well. Drop a message in the chat to let us know how you're feeling and if you're interested in more art therapy workshops. The Endometriosis Network Canada is really excited to announce the formation of our 2S LGBTQQIA plus advisory committee in which we will be working on engaging the 2S LGBTQQIA plus community and learning of all concerns and needs to help further develop resources and support for all people living with endometriosis. If you would like to learn more, please contact info at endometriosisnetwork.ca. We're very happy to say that the Endo Network's Run to End Endo will be taking place from June 4th to 13th this year, and we encourage everyone participating to gather with a group of family, friends, maybe some fellow Endo warriors, and raise awareness together. Registration will be open shortly, and while we are continuing with a virtual event to hold space for our amazing friends all across Canada, there will be a casual meetup for those who wish to walk in person together, so stay tuned for more details. Thank you to everyone who has participated, donated, and contributed to the Endo Network's Run to End Endo. We truly could not have done it without all of you. We also wish to take a moment and ask our community members what types of events you wish to see 10C organize more of in the coming years. That could be medical webinars, wellness classes, fundraisers, or perhaps you have a new idea altogether. Please do let us know in the chat. We would love to hear from you. Before Alexis introduces our final guest, we are delighted to share with you all that this year marks the 10 year anniversary recognizing the Endometriosis Network Canada as a registered charity in Canada. We began as a small group of individuals that recognized the great need for endometriosis awareness and resources. And since then, we have accomplished so much. The tireless efforts of the incredible people, both past and present, have played a huge role in helping establish our organization as the driving force for endometriosis awareness and resources that we are now. 
This 10 year anniversary is such a monumental milestone for everyone here at 10C and we insist on celebrating with all of you, the Endo community, because we could never have done it without each and every one of you. Stay tuned for more details and information on how you can join us in celebration as we take a look back at our achievements over the last decade. Thank you to all the volunteers over the years, both past and present. Thank you for being so generous with your time and helping us grow, achieve our goals, and help us to get to where we are today. Thank you so much for your commitment to the Endometriosis Network Canada and your overall dedication to endometriosis awareness. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Absolutely. To close out our virtual Endo March, I am thrilled to introduce our final guest of the day, who so generously created our new signature mocktail, the Golden Goan. Gabriel Altros is a Toronto-based graphic designer, artist, and illustrator. He spends most of his time making things that feel alive to the taste, eyes, ears, and he hopes the soul. Please find a comfortable place to sit, cuddle up with your favorite blanket or heating pad, grab the ingredients for your beautifully golden mocktail as Gabe walks us through the creation, and then consider turning it into a cocktail while we tune in for a sneak preview of the upcoming Avocado Toast series. We have a preview of some selected scenes from the upcoming Canadian Screen Award nominated series Avocado Toast Season 2, which can be found on OutTV and Amazon Prime. These scenes have not been color graded or sound edited yet, but the creators were so eager to share them with our incredible community during virtual Endo March. One of the creators is an Endo warrior named Heidi Lynch, and one of the lead characters, Molly, is on an Endo Adeno journey. She struggles with reaching out for help and a support system, and her new unexpected roommate, Marvin, teaches her that she doesn't need to do anything to deserve support. Everyone deserves support from their community, whether their difference is visible or invisible. As mentioned, these are just a few scenes to follow, so definitely follow Avocado Toast Series on Instagram or go to www.avocadotoasttheseries.com to watch Season 1 and to keep updated on when Season 2 airs. Thank you all for joining us for another incredible virtual Endo March. We are sending each and every one of you love and light in your Endo journeys today and always. Cheers. Cheers. Happy virtual Endo March, everyone.